is Wolferton Transmitting Station near Ludlow in England on this fine and sunny day. It's a change it's not raining. My name's Dave. I'm a transmitter engineer at this uh, site. If you just look round you can see the satellite dishes behind me from which we obtain all the feeds for the shortwave services that are broadcast from here. Further in the background are the shortwave antenna arrays and the site covers about 320 acres. The site was obtained in 1943 and was built by the BBC as Wufferton Transmitting Station. But they didn't call it that to start with, it was called Overseas Station Extension Number 10, OSE 10, and it was the last one of the Aussies, as they were called, that were built. It kept the name Aussie 10 until about 1960 when it became again Wufferton Transmitting Station. When the station was first built, it was equipped with six RCA 50 kilowatt shortwave transmitters that came across from the States on lease lend and were installed in the building. So the, the total power output of the station was about 300 kilowatts, 6 by 50. That situation continued until 1963 when by then the Americans had taken an interest in this site. Actually they started in 1948 and used four or six of the RCAs as the VOA, the Voice of America Relay Station in the United Kingdom. They carried on like that until 60, 1960 when it was almost going to shut the station but then the uh, fiasco in Cuba arose and uh, the Voice of America realized they needed more power to get the message to the Soviet Union. So they uh, decided to upgrade Wufferton as their relay station and they had it equipped in 1963 with six 250 kilowatt shortwave transmitters made by Marconi and these were, this was the first site that these transmitters were ever installed and we'll go and look at those in a little while. So that gives you a rough idea by of the progress until about 1963. The Cold War continued and by 1979 President Reagan was in a spending mood and he decided to um, invest more money in the Voice of America so they decided to remove the two remaining RCA 50 kilowatt transmitters that were not in use, they were just down the end of the building. They removed the two of those and installed four 300 kilowatt Marconi automatic type transmitters and they're still in use today. We'll go and look at those in a little while. And that's how it continued with 10 effective 250 stroke 300 kilowatt transmitters. So the station from 1979 to the year 2005 was pretty well equipped with 10 350 kilowatt transmitters and that was the mainstay of the system. Okay so let's now get inside the building and uh, show you what happens in there. I've come to this door a good few times since I arrived here in December 1982 and uh, I've stayed for, that's quite frightening, almost 30 years before finally walking out of the door. But anyway, off we go. First thing to see in here is the Great Circle map. Many of you will be familiar with one of these. From the UK, it's centred on London, and um, you can see that New Zealand is not quite uh, as it would appear on a flat map. And Australia doesn't quite look the same, but Africa is fairly well defined, as is South America and North America. As you see, London's the centre. And we've just popped three bearings on there, just one of the arrays outside. It's a 21 megahertz array we've illustrated. And it just shows you the countries that you can cover on the beams that you can send out from the array. The normal array will be 114 degrees. Uh, but we're able to move it 12 degrees to 102 and 12 degrees to 126. So we can start to cover different countries. You can see the Horn of Africa on 126. And um, you can see as we go down on 114, it goes through Albania and then on to, almost on to Mecca. 102 degrees, popular bearing these days for shortwave broadcasting, is towards Baghdad and uh, Tehran. So um, you can see the, the three slews there. This array that we're talking about was a 21 megahertz array and it also will slew backwards, it will reverse. Uh, so you can cover different parts of the United States. You have the central part here, Central America is there, and then the mid, mid states and then over to the, the north coast or the west coast, north, the northwest coast. So a very versatile uh, set of bearings there for that particular shortwave array. I'll just stop and look at these few photographs. 
of Wolfeson by, uh, by night on the satellite farm, or by evening sunset, I should say. Then uh, Wolfeson in the flood. The actual station is on a, is on a flood plain, almost, and the water is uh, only ever about 300 millimetres below the surface and often will appear on the surface. This makes it a great site for shortwave broadcasting. It's Wolferton in flood. Wolferton in the winter, you can see the hoarfrost on the arrays and on the tree. And the RF switch stations there that um, switch the different antennas to the different transmitter outputs. Wolferton in the fog. And the final picture is Wolferton as it was in after 1979 up to about 2005 with the six 250 kilowatt Marconi transmitters towards us, and in the rear hall, not terribly well lit there, are the three 300 kilowatt Marconi transmitters. Right, let's go through into the hall, which doesn't look the same as that now. That's because there was an upgrade in the year 2005, where the first one of the Marconi 250 kilowatt transmitters was removed and replaced by a unit from Croatia, made by RIS, Radio Industries Zagreb. It was a 500 kilowatt transmitter far too powerful for the arrays that we have here. So um, the company asked that it be downsized to 250 kilowatts and that's what was done. That was the first one that was placed but unlike any of the previous installations it was placed in a fire cell. This was the modern technique and it's done to, to prevent any damage to the rest of the building should a catastrophic fault occur on the transmitter and it does burst into flames. The modernization continued with, that was Sender 96 that was first removed. Sender 94 was taken out afterwards. Then Sender 92, which is to my right here, and the latter one that was taken out was Sender 91. That left us with two of the 1963 senders, Sender 93 and Sender 95. So these are the fire cells. We'll just walk past. We're going to look at the vintage Sender 93 first. It's uh, Sender 95, one of the senders that were installed in 1963. It's uh, brother next door, Sender 93 was the prototype. We're going to have a look at that one in a moment with all the doors open. But first, just to give you an impression of the three units here that make a 250 kilowatt shortwave sender, let's just have a look at the first one. This is the main RF unit, radio frequency unit. Metering on the front, handles on the front for manual tuning. These senders are manually operated and manually tuned. Comprehensive metering here of what we need to see when you're using a broadcast transmitter. In a little while we'll switch this on and you'll be able to see it all work. But just to look at it cold, we've got unbalanced power, penultimate anode current, we'll look at that. VSWR, a term with which many of you will be familiar. Final anode current, balanced power for the output. And then you've got the meeting of the four tubes or the four valves in the transmitter. There's a pen RF stage here and a final RF stage here. Power comes in, at about uh, 5 kilowatts, we generate 5 kilowatts of carrier and feed it to these pen tubes. They're grounded grid, so very stable. We tune the anode with the white handles. We tune the cathodes of the next stage, the final stage, with the green handles. And we tune the output anode circuit of the final stage with the orange handles. We can alter the power that goes up and down. So we can alter the power that goes out to the array by up and down by the two knobs there. And there's metering of various voltages on the, on the filaments of the tubes. That's the RF section. I've told you about we need five kilowatts of drive. Marconi's were always very savvy. If they wanted five kilowatts, they'd see what they got in their shop. And what they had was a five kilowatt amplifier. This is the H1100. Absolutely bog standard. RF amplifier, much used by the military, one tube in the output, a wideband valve amplifier, and now a synthesizer from which we can generate the frequencies that we need. This one you can see is set to 13.7 megahertz. Manually operated, tuned, tune and load, plate tune, plate load, quite standard, standard design. As I say, up to five kilowatts out, this unit was available in various versions of AM. You could have an amplitude modulator with it if you wished. You could have it frequency shift key. You could CW it, as we do here. Or you could use it on FM with various options. But obviously this was the basic 
carrier only, five kilowatt option. So that's the H1100, air cool. Let's go through and look at the other bit. The RF section, as you know, generates 250 kilowatts of carrier. To become a broadcast station, though, you do need something more than that, and you do need modulation, you do need program input on the carrier. This is the modulator, high level, class B. So you're looking at a valve modulator here to generate about 180,000 watts of audio. I'll say that again, 180,000 watts of audio. They take the, um, the advantage here of using the, R of the away from the RF to make the modulator the control department where you can switch the sender on and off, you can meter various voltages, as well as being an audio amplifier. In addition, we've removed the cathode ray oscilloscope that was used for waveform monitoring and replaced it with the industry standard Orban HF processing unit. Within here are the settings that are required to make it punchy audio and to give the, uh, give the sound that, that, that we want on shortwave to break through the interference and static, etc. So that's the Orban. This is on Sender 93. We've looked at Sender 95 complete. This is Sender 93 with the doors open. So, Sender 93's RF output appears on the coax at the top. It's not coax like you'd expect at home. It's rigid aluminium inner, or copper inner and aluminium outer. And the five kilowatts goes along the coax and appears into the top of the sender where it goes downwards and enters into a ferrite ballon. This is located deep in the bowels of the sender and is a devil to change if it goes faulty. So let's go around the corner now and look at the, uh, the pen RF stage and then we'll work our way through onto this side onto the final RF stage and then we'll look at the uh, power output at the top there. So let's go around the corner. Yeah, the RF comes in on the coax, hits the ballon, and then it's split between the two tubes. Here's one of the tubes here, and the other one is behind. They're both ceramic bodied ones. You can see the white, the white pot finish. Marconi's uh, described the wave change procedure for these transmitters as that you remove the plug-in coils. Here's an example of one of the plug-in coils. Plug in. Goodness me, I need to get stronger. There we are. This is the plug-in coil, and out it comes. See, it's got a locating peg here. And uh, a set of them are available for all the different frequencies, all the wave bands that we use. This is uh, 17 megahertz and 15 megahertz. And just, just slots it. And away we go. The coils were not made by Marconi's themselves. We understand that they were made by a, a firm in the UK called Boozy and Hawks. And to anybody that plays a trombone or other uh, brass musical instruments, that's often the source of uh, such an instrument is Boozy and Hawks. So they're into making tons of coil. Here uh, on the pen stage, you can see the way that the filament supply is routed through the uh, pyrotanax feed choke, and there are some suppression resistors on there, so the fills are routed down there. The reason for that is that the RF is fed into the cathodes of the valves, and you don't want the RF to go down the cathode, down the filament supply. You want it to go into the, the filament itself, into the cathode. So you have to have an RF choke to prevent that happening, and there it is. As I say, the grid's grounded here, and the anode is the boiler in which the anode sits of this tube, steam-cooled, so the water, this deionized water, comes up through the, uh, through the white pipe into the bottom of the, be of the boiler, overflows a weir, and the steam and uh, excess water go off down this glass tube for insulation, and the, all that lot's taken down the back and then condensed. So that's how that works. That's absolutely standard vapor cooling. Very efficient, because of course you take the water from water into steam, which takes a lot of heat away. This is this uh, peculiar thing here, is a fixed capacitor, value of 1,000 picofarads, glass, made by Jennings in 1963. It's one we haven't broken. You can see the uh, large transformers underneath to supply the uh, current for the tubes. 
OK, so out the anode via that capacitor, and we hit the, uh, we hit the fills again via this coil, another plug-in coil. We hit the fills of the output stage, and if, if we just look below, you'll see the, uh, the large boiler within which the BY1144 output tube is, is mounted. These two uh, plates here, nice smooth edges here to prevent any RF, to prevent voltage flashover, high voltage flashover. These have got two resistors mounted. That's copper at the top on the boiler, and that's copper at the bottom on the boiler. And across that are two 68 ohm resistors to stabilize that stage. It looks weird that you've got copper and copper and resistors, but it does work. You can see a much larger steam pipe to the right hand side. And of course the ceramic on these output tubes is much larger than on the pen stage. The pen stage gives about 40 to 50 kilowatts output. These tubes give 125 kilowatts each. So um, it's a much larger tube. The fill supplies are much more uh, comprehensive. So you've got four chokes for two tubes. Here's one of them. The one there. There's, within the tube are two separate filaments. To 325 amps at 9 volts on each one. And there's the there's the connections to one set of the filaments and off it goes into the valve. Okay, that's the uh, that's the RF stage from the drive stage. Let's go have a look at the RF stage from the output. Okay, well here we are in the RF section. This is the actual output stage of the sender. You can see the two RF tubes mounted in the boilers. Again, they've got the water pipes below, just like on the pen stage. And um, different here, of course, in that you've got one of the output coils this is a 15 megahertz output coil, also works on 13 megahertz, which corresponds with the frequency on the synthesizer that you've uh, just seen. Um, 30 megahertz coil. The HT, the high voltage, modulated high voltage, comes from an enclosure at the rear called the modulation enclosure. And it appears at the center tap here, through this little bit of parasitic stopper, and then onto the center of the coil. So that's onto one anode, one plate, and that's onto the other plate. That is tuned by two capacitors underneath, vacuum variable ones, to work from the handles at the front, and resonates at 15 or 17 or 13 megahertz. That's that coil. The coil below is the coupling coil, and is mounted on this truck. The truck's motorized, and we can work it from those buttons that we saw at the front, and from here, if we wish to set it up to what position we need. The further it moves away, the less power is sucked out of the valves, and the closer it gets, the more power. So we can run up to 250 kilowatts in this position, and if we reverse it a little bit, we can run as low as about 100 kilowatts quite reliably. The, uh, the RF passes then, is now converted from a balanced system, again, to a balanced system. So balanced to balanced output, and it whizzes up through the arms here, and then through the coils and capacitors inside this filter. This cuts any spurious off above 30 megahertz. Um, it wends its way and eventually ends up on the two connections at the back there. You can see they're earthed down at the moment. They're open. They're not connected, and they're earthed down above, so that we can work in here and not get pick up from other antennas on the field with senders radiating. So that's a broken connection to the outside world. When we shut the doors and lock it up, that becomes complete. How are the two connections at the top? They're, they're the actual 320 ohms output balance feeder. There they are at the top there. And they take the, the power down the field in a balanced system. So that's a 250 kilowatt output RF stage. Let's go and have a look at the modulator now. Here we are in the modulator stage. The, uh, you'll see a, an aluminium chassis there with a heat sink on it. That's a solid state audio amplifier. Replaced a, a leak audio amplifier from the 1960s. Remember, these were built in 1963. So obviously designed about 1961, 1962. And um, Marconi's used a leak TL10 or no, TL12 plus amplifier. Four or five valves, EF86, ECC81, a pair of EL84s, and a GZ34 to give 10 watts out into two 100 ohm resistors on anti-phase. So you've got one phase one side and one phase for the other. 
We replaced the amplifier in the 1970s by, um, or 1980s actually, by a solid state one because it was getting hard to source uh, all the tubes by then. So that's the solid state amp then that drives the first audio, which is here, which is a TT21, the GEC tube, much used by Marconi's. That's capacity coupled. You can see some rather large capacitors. That's capacity coupled into the next stage, which is a pair, this side, of 813s. And if you just look to the rear, there's another pair on the other side. This is a push-pull amplifier. So this valve is replicated on the other side. The two 813s are over the other side. The 813s serve as a voltage amplifier. You want, we want to get here a swing of voltage, about 1,000 volts, peak to peak. That's what we want from this stage. We want to drive the output valves hard. So to get that, there's 1,000 volts of swing, but there is a slight complication when driving triodes. If you just look through, you can see the triode tube sat in the output there. Exactly the same tube as used on the RF. BY1144L. However, to get the power out, we need to drive these valves in class B. Class B normally involves grid current. But the poor old 813s can't deliver power. They can deliver voltage, but not power. So to get power, we need an intermediate stage. And here we have a pair, this side, of uh, English electric valves, BY1654Fs. Uh, satin boilers again, you can see the, uh, the, the, the steam take off here and you can see the water input from the base. So we've got the cathode followers here then that convert the 1000 volt swing from the 813s into a low impedance feed for these two output tubes. These can be convert that feed to low impedance because we want to drive these things with power or we want to drive them into grid current. There's a better view here on the modulator of the tube set up as it's more open. You can see the grid here attached by this ring. That's the actual grid connection. Best put it on. The heat, the filaments or the heaters are um, here on one side. That's one side of the connections and here's the other. And there's air blast cooling from above to keep these connections cool. We've got the boiler again bolted down. And we've got these stra this strange piece of um, fishing line here. This is called a heat fuse, and it's on the tube there. And it's solder that should the, heat, should, the heat, should the tube overheat, the solder will melt, and the spring here will pull that off, and the switch will shut, and that will turn off the high voltage on the transmitter. So it's a protection circuit against the water flow failing. This assembly here is a collection of capacitors and resistors, a, a ladder of them, a feedback ladder, and from, that's, from one end of it is connected to the valve anode, the other end is connected to earth, but we, we just take a little fraction of the voltage from the far end and send it back to the front of the transmitter as negative feedback, and we run about 15 dBs negative feedback. 21 is possible, or naught, it's switchable at the front. So that's the negative feedback. You've got various suppression components in here, just like on the RF, except the design for audio. So that's the modulator. In a minute, go through to the modulation enclosure and see what's in there. But just to get in there, we need to gain access from this panel here. It's at the moment it is unlocked, but uh, we need to get one of these keys out. These are called Castell keys. This one's got a number inside. It says 93 on it, etched, engraved inside. And it's such that when you put it in, it locks with the, um, the eye dent on the other side. So 93 fits with 93. You can't get 95 to go in there. I've already got a key here in the door. So we can open the door, go in through. And this is the, the sort of oily, smelly type area where the transformers live. The main transformer, Z, actually 2S, because there are two of them, are here. These take 11 kV, 11,000 volts AC from the national grid and drop it, drop it down to about 10,000 or 9,000 volts. Two of them and we feed the 9,000 volts or so via these copper bars here through to a solid state rectifier which replaced a mercury arc rectifier. So it's a solid state rectifier just the other side of the door which then generates the DC. So that's the mains transformers. 
the power from the modulator arrives, here's one of them coming in from one of the modulation anodes onto one terminal of the modulation transformer. Across here is the other, and there's a centre tap where the 11 kV, 11,000 volts DC starts here. Notice we've got an earth wand on it. If you're watching in the States, it's a shorting stick in your country, but it's an earth wing wand in the UK. It's often said that when the transmitter staff retire, they hang up their earthing wand. That's one of the standard phrases. So that's the modulation transformer. Various bits of protection here. Ball gaps for flashovers and metrosills, which are like voltage-controlled resistors. Big voltage, it'll just shatter, but it will save the windings in the transformer. Just looking through here, <coughs> we can see three large capacitors on the floor. A set of three. These are modulation blocking capacitors and are from one connection of the mod transformer to earth. The other connection up to the HT line is made by this reactor, which is here. It's always a reactor in the States, a choke in the UK. This is a, a low frequency reactor. It allows us to pass the DC through the reactor to the secondary of the mod transformer. The audio power gets superimposed on the DC, which then flows out to the tubes and the DC is prevented from flowing through the modulation transformer secondary by the capacitors on the ground. <coughs> it's a standard way of doing it. If you just look through there, you'll see some more choke, uh, some more capacitors and some chokes, some smoothing chokes, there for the power supply smoothing for the, the regular 11,000 volt DC. We're looking to get 11,000 volts at about 50 or 60 amps, so we're looking for about a 600 kilowatts power load of HT at maximum modulation. You'll see some Jennings switches on the wall. These switch resistance mats out in rush protection. There they are. Behind that, are, and up to, a, up to the high level, is the air blast cooling department uh, to generate the air that blows through the cubicles. And right above you, we have one more vacuum switch with a, a large wire attached to it. It's got HT on one side, HV on one side, and a big fat green and yellow wire on the other. That's a crowbar switch that, uh, when we turn the transmitter off, that shorts out any HT that's left in the system. So that's the crowbar switch on the main HT. That's one you don't want to fail when it's running program. Okay, and so we've looked at the modulation enclosure. Let's just come out again and look at the, some of the coils that we use for uh, the various frequencies. This is an anode coil here for uh, the 9 megahertz band, 31 meter band. Looking down here, there's an anode coil for 21 megahertz band. It's behind the door, collection of coils. Here's a coupling coil for 12 megahertz, and an anode coil behind it with another one as well, for both for 12 megahertz, on the final stage. These uh, heavier construction ones, here's a, um, a pen anode coil for 12 megahertz and whoops a coupling coil for into the into the final stage for 6 megahertz far more turns on that one and the ubiquitous stepped bar enables us to connect to like a, a preset a fixed coil that's already mounted in the transmitter for the lower frequencies for 9 7 6 and 4 megahertz so that's that it's in remote control at the moment. The light says so, so it must be. It's in remote control. I'm going to take it off remote and uh, power it up manually. So let's take the uh, HT off. Let's put it to local. This one's already on. So up we go. We've got relay supply. We've got the water coming up. It is already there. The air supply's on. Preamps got its supplies. And we're just waiting now for the filaments to light. Let's wander around the side. I'll open it up so you can see the tubes on. We need to take the power supply off, or the HV power supply. We need to open the isolator, wait for the motor to run through, and let's get some earths on. That gives me access to the key, or one of them. If we open this door here, I have a good view of the uh, valve fills. This is an old tube, an old style BUI 1144L, and it's got the glass body, and you can see the uh, you can see the two heat fuses on this one. 
and you can see the fills up now. The cathode followers again, they're an old style of cathode follower, 3Z222EW, made by STNC, replaced by the, Mar the uh, E2V ones, which are at the back there, but you can see the fills on inside the, uh, inside the old girls there. Right, we'll shut this back up again so we can uh, continue the power up. There you go. Earth's off. Motorised isolator shut. Power supply on. Thank you very much. Okay, off we come round the front then, see what we've got. That's a good sign. Okay, we've now got the fills on. The first AF HT and BIOS is on, that's those TT21 tubes, they've got the supply, the AUX HT is on. And uh, we're ready, we haven't got an antenna on this one yet, so we can't progress any further until we do that. We'll go away and sort that in a moment, and then we'll have it on the air. We're now in one of the uh, RIS transmitter fire cells. Not to work on the RIS transmitter, but to actually just a quick look at the control system, because we need to put an array, an antenna, on Sender 95, so we can power it up for you. This is the manual part of the uh, screen. And as you can see, we've, sent, we've programmed, we've asked for Sender 95 to be there. It's on AUX at the moment, it hasn't got any high voltage on it. It's going to be an AM amplitude modulation at 250,000 watts, 13.700, which you've seen before on the synthesizer. The antenna we're going to use is 953, and it's on a bearing of 75 degrees, well it will be when we uh, enter all that information. When I press the, the send command, it will then, the information will go out, the switches in the, in the antenna field will move and will select array 953, put the bearing on 75 degrees, and it will go on to sender 95. The right hand screen will show that for you. We've got the, the 10 senders available to us at Wolferton on the right hand side. The, the numerical order is not what you'd expect, but it's the way that they actually appear out of the building and then down the antenna field. This is an absolute picture of what it's like outside. So the most northerly switch station is 80, oh, sorry, the most easterly switch station is, eight, a switch, uh, transmitter is 84, and the most westerly is 92. But this is the way it's configured. So we're going to look at 95. Here are positions where switches are available. We run down here. There's another couple of switches down the end here. Let's just, uh, send this command then here, if I can find the, uh, here he is, if I can find send, and then we'll have a look at this side as 95 attempts to pick up an array. Thank you very much. As you see, it's now got a black line on it, it goes to array 953 switch, and we follow that up and out it goes to array 953. The green circle indicates that everything is A-OK -okay for power, so let's go outside now and put 95 on the air. Well, we, uh, we join you again now. We've now got the antenna, array 953, it's got an interlock, it's on the front there. Um, we're going to put the HT on on this transmitter, the high voltage, and progress through to um, the, the, the HT is a normal value, and there's enough grid drive to light the modulator, to let the modulator pass audio power and we'll, you'll be able to see that run up and then you'll see me walk towards the um, sections and do the rest of the tune up. So I put the HT on there, we've got a green and if we just look at the top there we've got the main HT at about 10.5 kV. Right if I just progress now to the drive stage past the RF ready to go on 13700. Press the HT. There we are, we've got about uh, 3 kilowatts. 3 kilowatts on this frequency. Cathode current, just under an amp. And as I say, the power is coming over the coax then into the RF section. Meters are fairly well balanced, you can see there. Uh, you've got meter readings here of balanced power final anode current, about 22 amps on this service. SWR, 1.05 to 1, which is a pretty good figure to have. And the penultimate anode current, 
just over about four and a half amps. Four and a half amps of MKB, about 44 kilowatts in, so 30 kilowatts or so, leaving this stage into there. Right, here we are then on the final stage. We're going to go for a manual tune-up now. So you're able to see the meters move and see what we have to do to uh, tune the transmitter. It's actually tuned, but we'll give you a quick demo of how it works. So the pen stage first. Like most amps, uh, min on the uh, plate feeds, min on the anode feeds, max on the grids. Let's have a look. So pen stage, we're looking at this as the combined metering. I'm going to turn the controls now. Oh dear. Didn't like that. As you were, keep it running. So that's the pen stage tube, just over four amps. We're looking at the grid here now, just over two. And we also look at the pen to see that they're balanced. If I just alter them slightly, just get them about the same. There we are. Nicely balanced. Grid's balanced, good. Look at the finals. Hands move down. I moves to this meter combined. Dip at 22 amps. Look at the final stage here. And set them both for the same value, just over right there. Run to that's uh, that's 22 amps. It's about 220 kilowatts. Want to run a bit more power, 250. Just couple up to 26 amps. 26 amps, 250 kilowatts. 15 amps, 150 kilowatts. Easy. How much power would you like for about 22 amps, 220 kilowatts? Is that done? Okay, well the cameraman zoomed inside now. We've put modulation on the sender. So you can see the cathode current now peaking, 5 to 10 amps or so. Just on the meter above it is the grid current. Just nibbles a little few milliamps there as, it, um, as the final stage runs into grid current. Just look now at the ore band. You'll be able to see the uh, modulation on the front of the Orban Optimod unit. There we are. Here's the, uh, here's the mod on the Orban, and you can see the gain reduction taking place on the various frequency bands. The bands are 160 hertz, 420, 700, 1.8 kilohertz, and 3.7 kilohertz. You can see the content of the, uh, of the program material. So that's the Orban working. And the transmitter working at 220 kilowatts on 13.7 megahertz. Not bad for 49 years old. Since this was installed in 1963. Just look above here, we can see the number of hours that the machine has run. As a meter at the top, it says 218970. That's 218,970 hours of program material. Quite amazing, really, in 49 years. OK, so here we are we're continuing the tour at Wolfers and We've fast-forwarded now from 1963. We're now in 1979, 1980, 1981, looking at the, the, the next generation of senders that was installed here. There are four units made by Marconi, type B, 6124, the previous 250s are BD 272s. These are B6124s, four of them for the Voice of America, paid for by, by Ronald, he's a nice bloke. And um, totally different configuration to the previous system, as you'll see. It's like almost one continuous unit. We've opened a few doors for you. Got the RF section on the right hand side with a rogue Orban Optimod unit in there. And on the left hand side is the actual RF section itself. We'll have a look at the, just a quick look at the front panel here just to get a, an idea of what's involved. Frequency synthesizer again. These units have got 32 RF channels available. If we look here you can see we've got the 32 channels. We program those as humans to the frequency we want come down here, tune the sender up on the power, on power, tune it up, and then store the settings that we get. So they're manually set, and then it's able to remember the settings that we've put on as humans, and drag them out whenever it wants to, for the frequencies it does during the day and night. So these don't tune it from scratch, they have to be tuned manually, and then stored. This is the unit that uh, contains the 25 channels, 
and the tuning controls on the switches up and down with the readout display as you see this one's on 15 6 20 kilohertz and all the settings there are all stored the servo control for the capacitors and one inductor it's a roller inductor servo control the sender's clever enough to know if it's 15 megahertz it puts certain shorts on the coils inside and this unit decides where the shorts go analog metering is provided high level class b mod or a b it's actually it's in a b1 so grid current doesn't flow on the modulator tubes they're around the corner we'll have a look at those in a minute so you've got the modulators here and you've got the rf section metering sort of around the edge grid current screen grid current cathode current penultimate stage as well has got grid current screen grid current cathode current we'll have a look at um, one of these working on, an, on a later shot again the same sort of idea of indication of progress of transmission start with is the mains present fairly basic then you go through the cooling and the filaments and the standby aux ht main ht screen ht transmitter on but to get the yellows at the top here you need to get the greens below so have you got water have we got modulator water flow have we got rf water flow high pressure air low pressure air black heat filaments are energized rf flowing through the components all these supplies need to be on to progress to get the transmitter on the air the overloads for the transmitter are here and as I say, the all band mod, the OptiMod unit is in the front here. The modulator driver is here, solid state, with a bit of analog metering. The two modulator valves just took around the corner. Let's have a look at those. Here they are. Thompson tubes, hyper vapotron cooled. So cooling water in, hits the anode structure inside. It's ribbed all the way around, vertical ribs steam and water or steam is made by the dissipation uh, a bubble of steam uh, appears and then the water goes in to kill the steam take the heat away on the on the pipes there a different system to the uh, vapor system as on the uh, older transmitters filament uh, transformers below and current metering etc in the middle there so a b1 no grid current a pair of tetrode amplifiers Again, about 180 kilowatts, 200 kilowatts output. Very similar to the previous uh, transmitter. All right, this is the, um, the final RF stage above and the penultimate RF stage below on the 300 kilowatt B6124. The actual pen tube is located here in this little uh, section, for its own little section. It's fed with drive from 150 watt solid state amplifier. Uh, grounded cathode and the anode circuit here is comprised of 22 mil copper pipe with shorts on. These shorts can be pneumatically operated backwards and forwards. So obviously more coil in circuit, lower frequencies, less coil in circuit, higher frequencies. That's the switching for the pen. The pen drive then comes through and hits the grid of this final output stage. This is a 300 kilowatt output stage, again with a Talis tube. Tetrode, the 300 kilowatts is generated here. The drive for this comes from the pen, as I said, into the grid, and the anode circuit again is here. The tuning of the anode circuit is in two parts. We need to stop the RF going up the main HT power supply. So to do this, we have a parallel tuned circuit. Here's a Jennings capacitor and the Marconi inductor at the back. Here's a parallel tuned circuit. This is tuned to resonance on the carrier frequency. So the DC flows through the coil, but the RF has to flow down through the blocking capacitor here, down to the Pi network, which is the output. So there's the Pi blocking here, 1000 picofarads at uh, 44 kV, that one. We'll go around and look at that stage in a minute. Okay, so here again is the, pen, is the final stage here. Water-cooled capacitor, ceramic, sorry, vacuum vacuum capacitor, ceramic body, that, that, that carries the full 300 kilowatts plus modulation to hit the output stage Pi network which starts here and the first thing it finds is a motorized capacitor to earth we blow the edges, we blow the edges of these foils 
because the RF always wants to go down the edge, not among the whole foil, so it tends to, to fry the edges. So we blow those with air to keep them as cool as we can. There's, at the back there is one of the shorts that's open. And that, will, that short would close on 26 and 21 megahertz, but it's open on this frequency, which is 15 megahertz. So the RF runs down through these 54 mil copper pipes. Eventually, after going through a, few, a couple of pie sections, it ends up at the back here, on this final run out from the bottom. Up it comes through the last two capacitors to earth, feeder load one and feeder load two, and it hits the second harmonic tuned circuit. There's the capacitor. The coil fridge is on the right hand side. So we um, again resonate this and that tuned circuit for the second harmonic. The RF lead leads as a, an unbalanced output at 75 ohms through this aperture here, through a, a, a filter in the, in the chassis work above us, a low pass filter to cut off all frequencies above 30 megahertz, and then up at 75 ohms into the, into the enclosure at the top. This is a tuned palsy stub ballon, 75 ohm input, it's a 4 to 1 transformer, so the output impedance is 300 ohms balanced, which is on the right hand side. So we get back to our balanced system to suit the arrays here at Wolferton. So that's a tuned palsy stub, 75 ohms input to 300 ohms output. Right, we've moved next door now from sender 82 to its brother, sender 84. This is one we've got set up for you so we can demonstrate it working. We've gone through uh, the control circuitry, etc., and the servos. You can see now, looking at the Orban Optimob, we've got some program material coming in. See the metering kicking up, etc. We're on 11915 kilohertz, 11915 in the 25 meter band. Uh, channel 17, it's labelled on this sender. What we're going to do is um, continue on from where we are on standby. If we just uh, focus in now, you'll see that we've got the, uh, the mains on, cooling filaments, and we're up to standby. I'm going to make the main HT switch manually in a minute. That'll bring the AUX HT on, the main HT, the screen HT, and uh, the transmitter will come on the air. Then we'll have a look at the meters. It's okay, let's have a look here. The, uh, the standby switches are already on, so I'm going to go now for HD start, and off we go. On this, you get a, a low power version, and then it comes up to full power. So if you just look at the cathode current meter, and you'll see it will come on at a low value to start with. Right, here we go on the switch. And up we go to 30 amps. 30 amps of cathode current on the final stage at 11 kV, about 300 kilowatts input. If we just look up here, we'll see we've got about 250 on the out. Forward power, 250 kilowatts. BSWR, about 1.09. And backward power, not a lot. So that's a good, a good sign. Most things are working. Got modulation running. Grid current on the final stage, about 1.7 amps. Screen grid current, about 1.5 amps. Cathode current, 31 amps. We're driving from our wideband amplifier about 50 watts uh, into the pen stage. There's the pen current, 1.4 amps. Pen screen, 40 milliamps. Pen grid, no grid current. That's quite normal. We've got monitoring here of that bit of power, as I say, 50 watts from the drive. The other that's it, really. Not a lot else to tell you about that. You can see the modulation meters kicking with program.